Welcome to presentation number four in our series, Rereading Revelation. This I intend to be a new and updated version of an earlier series we did when we didn't know as much about how to use this equipment and, and some issues of content as well. So the title today, how to read Revelation. And Revelation is usually thought of as an extremely complicated book, but the how-to of how reading this book is quite simple. I have only three points uh, that are necessary to get a really good <coughs> grasp, a really good command of this book. <coughs> the first point is to become a re-reader. Now, I will refer to Vladimir Nabokov, who was a Russian uh, literary critic. He was also a novelist. He wrote a very famous book. You can Google it and find out what book that was. But he taught literary criticism at U.S. universities <coughs> uh, for much of his life. And in a series called Lectures on Literature, this is what he says, curiously enough, one cannot read a book. One can only reread it. A good reader, a major reader, an active and creative reader is a re-reader. So that goes to the quality of reading per se in itself <clears throat> to be a re-reader. And yes, Revelation is definitely in agreement with that and even more than Nabokov could express it. And so I have toyed with the idea of posting a sign like this as a sort of by the entry way to Revelation and say for re-readers only, because it is that sort of selectivity you have to have. You have to be a re-reader to get it right. And then <clears throat> here is the alternative poster re-readers welcome. Please come in because this book is very welcoming to the re-reader and quite unfriendly to the uh, uh, to the person who reads it only once if if that were to be uh, be the, the option. So let's look at how this might work when we look at the structure of Revelation which is a topic that occupies many and many, many scholars have tried to <coughs> sort out the structure and hoping that that would have explanatory power. So if we look at it here, uh, we can see that it begins with seven letters. And then there is the story of the seven seals. And then comes the seven trumpets. And now we are halfway through the book. And then I'm skipping a little thing here, leaving something out. And then you have the seven bowls and much of the book is covered by these, these items. But what does this have to do with re-readership? <clears throat> well, already at this stage, we can see some uh, interesting things. But here in the messages to, uh, in the seven letters, <clears throat> we have some promises given to the recipients of those letters. And those promises are actually taken from the ending of the book. So there is an echo of the ending of the book at the beginning of the book. But you would not know that those were echoes of the ending of the book if you had not read it. So as you come to the ending, you hear some things explained more fully, snippets of which are actually used here. So already at that stage, there is a reward for re-reading. But I left something out, <clears throat> the black hole. I call this structure of Revelation first draft. We have the cycles of seven, and then we have what I'm here calling a black hole, because <clears throat> try as they may, uh, interpreters of Revelation have wanted to make all the book into a sequence of seven. So seven letters, seven seals, seven trumpets, and then seven whatever here. <laughs> it hasn't been very successful to make that work. So we still have only these seven letters, seven seals, seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. And then something here that is quite important doesn't quite conform to this, these septets, these sevens. So <clears throat> then 
<coughs> we cannot have a black hole. We have to f call it something. And yes, we will call it the story of cosmic conflict, a war in heaven theme that expands the horizon of revelation to make it cosmic and not only historical, not only earthly events, but a cosmic reality. And this story is so important that it is no harm that the structure is sort of defeated by it, that this thing has to be fitted into the structure one way or another. <clears throat> and this is how I propose to do it. And I have great support from many scholars who have <clears throat> wrestled with the literary uh, structure of Revelation that the chapter 12 is the central chapter, that story of the cosmic conflict. And one can easily see how this chapter influences the ending of the story, how you move from chapter 12 to 20, chapter 20. Satan is introduced. Here Satan is bound and released and then comes to an end. So there is a logical progression here. What is less well recognized is that this chapter also influences Revelation's message upstream. That you go back to chapter 4 and you have to know chapter 12 to get <clears throat> the earlier story right, to get that into perspective. <clears throat> so there is <clears throat> And no uh, black hole. This is the story of the cosmic conflict. And now this is not a draft anymore. This is the last uh, result. And then <clears throat> let's uh, uh, do one more thing. Let's just reorganize it a little more. Here it looks like you have a sequence. <clears throat> and this one is an element in a certain sequence. But here you have a center where the various element in the revela in revelation are organized around the center as though they are spokes on a wheel and each element the seven letters the seven seals seven trumpets and seven bowls they have an immediate relationship to the story of cosmic conflict, not just a distant linear relationship. And I am happy <clears throat> for this statement by Adela Yarbrough Collins. She is a major New Testament scholar in our time, has been a professor at Yale until her retirement. She's married to John Collins, who is one of the foremost experts in the world on apocalyptic literature. And <clears throat> her earlier work was on Revelation. She wrote a number of books uh, on the subject, and her dissertation was on the theme of cosmic conflict in Revelation 12. So here is what she says about the upstream influence of chapter 12. <clears throat> She's commenting on chapter 5, a scene in the heavenly council. And she says, the first four verses of chapter 5 imply that the heavenly council is faced with a serious problem. And <clears throat> then she explains, in the context of the apocalypse as a whole, it is clear that the problem facing the heavenly council is the rebellion of Satan, which is paralyzed by rebellion on earth. But the rebellion of Satan is not told to the reader of Revelation fully until chapter 12. So Adela Yarbrough Collins is putting to use her insight as rereader. She has read chapter 12. She knows that it matters to the scene in chapter uh, 5. And she knows that better than most readers because few readers actually, scholarly and otherwise, pay heed to that insight. Chapter 5 presupposes the old story of Satan's rebellion against God, which leads to the fall of creation. And here you can imagine then a scene in the heavenly council, a crisis in the heavenly council over the problem of Satan's rebellion, as Adela Yarbrough Collins explains it. And this leads us to a storyline, and I will illustrate it by some uh, paintings by William Blake from uh, uh, more than a century ago, where <coughs> 
the Satan isn't, or Satan in Revelation, Satan wasn't always a bad person. Here is Blake's depiction of Satan before his fall as an illustrious being. And then he has <coughs> described Satan's fall, and this is in uh, Blake's um, uh, illustrations of the book of Job. And there is the Ancient of Days, and here is <coughs> Satan for some reason losing his innocence and launching a rebellion and, in, and then losing his place, as it were, in heaven. And then as a final uh, illustration here, just to establish the storyline, Satan going forth from the presence of God to wreak havoc in the world, to inflict suffering on Job, to inflict suffering on the world. That is what Yarbrough Collins says is the storyline. And she is good for saying that. And it is far more important to Revelation that even she recognizes in my view. So, <clears throat> the question of access denied versus access granted is in the nature of the book. That is to say, access to the rereader and not to the uh, one-time reader, because you have to be a rereader to get it. So, um, don't be offended that I say access here for the rereader of Revelation. Or in this illustration here, let me <clears throat> step aside here. Here you see it. Rereaders. Revelation welcomes rereaders. It really does. <clears throat> the second point is to pay attention to Revelation's use of the Old Testament and to recognize that the key to Revelation's message is really the Old Testament allusions. That is a key, certainly, if not the key. And I will use Richard Bockham as my, <clears throat> my source here for that. Revelation's use of the Old Testament scriptures is an essential key to its understanding. The pattern of almost continuous allusion to the Old Testament throughout the book is a pattern of disciplined and deliberate allusion to specific Old Testament texts. I wish I could have written that as precisely and as emphatically as Bochum expresses it. I think he is right. <clears throat> Let's just look at that. Here you have pay attention to the Old Testament background, and we have Old Testament here in the background, and <clears throat> we have Bochum commenting on this by saying that allusions are meant to recall the Old Testament context, which thereby becomes part of the meaning the apocalypse conveys, and to build up sometimes by a network of allusion to the same Old Testament passage in various parts of the apocalypse, an interpretation of whole passages of Old Testament prophecy. So you read the book of Revelation, and you you have read the, some things in the Bible before. That sounds like that. That sounds like that. That's the voice of Isaiah. That's the voice of Ezekiel. And, and you get a sort of into a habit of thinking that maybe what Revelation says in various places has some antecedent in the Old Testament. <clears throat> now, formerly, there was little or no attention to the Old Testament voices among readings of Revelation. That is also true for the way this book has been read in my faith community. There was a person by the name of Uriah Smith who wielded huge influence in my faith community for a hundred years and wrote extensively on Revelation pages after pages, but very little attention to the Old Testament. Now that has been remedied in to some extent, and remedied to some ex uh, greater extent in the scholarly community, it is recognized that we have to pay close attention to the Old Testament background to get this right. He, John would not have done it if not for that. <clears throat> so, which Old Testament voice then <clears throat> is loudest? Is that that could be meaningful to to uh, see? And here. <clears throat> 
we have uh, in this Martin Schongau's illustration, there is John on Patmos and he is about to write and he has a vision. But this John on Patmos is also a reader. He's not just a visionary. So here then <clears throat> the word, the Old Testament and vision, they combine. There is word as much as there is vision. And then I have to emphasize this because this is a misconception. Revelation is not simply the second volume of Daniel, as though Daniel is the only uh, Old Testament book that matters. Revelation is also more than a collection of Old Testament passages that are haphazardly put together. It is thought. There is a coherence of thought. There is the the sort of massaging of thought into this whole text so that all these diverg divergent Old Testament voices, they become a coherent whole. John is on Patmos, <clears throat> and I just want to illustrate uh, some of the Old Testament voices here, such as Isaiah, <clears throat> a major contributor to Revelation, and the scriptural passages I have quoted here, does not, they do not exhaust the list of texts that echo in Revelation, but they, they, I mean to show that, they, that Isaiah is a major contributor to John's worldview. That's one, number one. And this, by the way, is Michelangelo's illustration of Isaiah in the Sistine Chapel. And then, sure, Daniel is one of the others. Daniel is also a, a contributor, and you can see some of the texts that echo in Revelation taken from Daniel. It is extensive. When we put these together, these texts, and these texts, we are already having a formidable menu of Old Testament texts to keep us busy in our reading of Revelation. And it doesn't stop there, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Here is Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a major contributor. He competes easily with Daniel as a, as a major voice. <clears throat> None of them can quite outdo Isaiah in my view, <clears throat> but they, they are part of it. And here, big time, Genesis, the ancient serpent. Where is that coming from? And for John Patmos, his interest in the ancient serpent. Well, he wouldn't be that if not for Genesis, because that is where you have the serpent story and in the beginning of the Bible. And here is one more, <clears throat> and this is not the end of it, but here is Zechariah, again with a whole slew of verses that echo in the book of Revelation. This is the world of John on Patmos as a reader, and as a visionary, and as a thinking person. That's what we have to uh, recognize. And then <clears throat> just one more thing here, uh, uh, to conceive of the Bible then as a library. And of course, John's library is not these books. <clears throat> it is uh, uh, the Old Testament. So here, where does that end? It ends here. And <clears throat> there is a kind of curious symmetry here, because the book of Genesis, the first two chapters of Genesis, they are replicated, they echo in the last two chapters of Revelation in such a way that you almost get the feeling that John knows that he will be writing the last book of the Bible, that he knows it. There is a book ending here, creation. And here, new creation. It's amazing that you could do that and that you could in some, in some way have a sense of the whole, that the Bible is one book, though many books, partly because of that huge contribution of John on Patmos. <clears throat> John was writing, says Bauckham, I think he's right, John was writing the climax of prophetic revelation, which gathered up the me prophetic meaning of the Old Testament scriptures. That's one way to see it. My third point, <clears throat> third point on how to read revelation. God is not the only one 
who is at work in the world. That's number three. <clears throat> I don't know which one of these is more important. They all vie for first place. This is Anton Föckle in a, an article in German, the Gotter Apocalypse, <clears throat> in a book written some years ago. God is not the only one who is at work in this world, as the apocalypse makes so abundantly clear. And there is havoc in the world. There is a conflagration, evil, and the perpetrator hiding from sight. That is what it means. There is no easy explanation for the evil in the world because of the concealment, or concealment on the part of the perpetrator. God is not the only one. It's not though, as though you can break reality down to God and humans in a sort of two, two uh, uh, in a linear way, or it's just a line, God and human. You have a non-human reality here. You have a triangular shape to reality. And that corner of the triangle has in some ways been obscured, has in some ways disappeared from the way uh, <clears throat> many readers uh, do it. So I have used this illustration before in the cosmic conflict theme that you have on this side someone waging war by slander and deceit, slandering God, misrepresenting God, and deceit, misrepresenting himself too. And then you have God waging war by means of revelation. But the story in Revelation is not just about what God is doing. That is what <clears throat> we are learning here. Let me give an illustration of this one. This is in the context of the seven trumpets. <clears throat> and my claim here, God is not the only one. So here we read the text. And the first angel blew his trumpet. And there came hail and fire mixed with blood. And they were hurled to the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up. And a third of the trees were burned up. And all green grass was burned up. So this is a real calamity. Uh, uh, hitting the earth. And already here in the terms hail and fire mixed with blood, what kind of mixture is that? You can have hail and rain, but you don't usually have hail and fire. That's a strange combination. And we certainly don't have hail and fire mixed with blood, except as Revelation attempts to depict it when there is a demonic agent behind it, when this is the, the, this, this is the kind of admixture that you can see a demonic reality bringing to bear on the world. This is from the <coughs> welcome apocalypse from about 1450 in a book on Revelation that we only, I think there is only one cap copy extant, and here the first Angel is blowing his trumpet, and sure enough, the illustrator of the welcome apocalypse gets it right. These are the ones throwing the fire and uh, hail and fire mixed with blood on the world. There is a demonic reality. Now, of course, these images are exaggerated, and of course, there is a subtlety to evil that is not easily captured visually, but we get the point. So this is then the third point. God is not the only one who is at work in the world. So <clears throat> Revelation does this in text also, of course. It is the text that dictates it, and we could decipher it from the text, but I'm quite happy to see <clears throat> that illustrators have perceived this and have perceived it better than many contemporary readers that just obliterate uh, the evil one from their understanding. Okay, moving to <clears throat> another one. This is sort of outside the how to read part of my presentation. The how to read is become a re-reader, pay attention to the Old Testament, and know that God is not the only one who is at work in the world. Those are the three main points. 
But here is a little more about the format, the sort of setting for how to do this. So should one be a listener or a participant? Here you have an illustration. These are the listeners and someone has a board like I do here and I explain things on the board. So it's like a seminar. And Yes, in many faith communities, certainly in my faith community, the Revelation Seminar has been a major uh, uh, way of doing it. It is quite poorly suited to this text we are doing. Uh, first of all, there is a strong participatory element in the text. There is dialogue, there is give and take, voices talking to each other. How can you preserve that if you just do it in monologue. Just one person saying all of these things. It would be much better to have, to have it interactive. And yes, many times in the book of Revelation there is actually applause. They get up and they are totally taken in by it. You know, they're, they're <clears throat> it's, uh, it's uh, particip participatory. And this strengthens this old element that someone has called liturgical dialogue. There is an Italian uh, researcher, Ugo Vanni, who calls it liturgical dialogue. He sees it at the beginning and ending of Revelation. But there is actually a kind of, uh, uh, or a competition of voices, or an array of voices uh, uh, that... Uh, that is bigger than the liturgical dialogue. Uh, there is in Revelation a voice of accusation. And then there are voices that oppose the accusing voice, the slanderous voice. Those are the voices of proclamation. And then there is a third one. There are the voices of acclamation. So you might say there is a kind of one-two there opposing the accusing voice. How do you preserve that if you do it all in monologue? And so this is a question I have, how to preserve the sound and the subtlety of revelation, how to safeguard the poetic evocative force of this book, and, and how to make the book's beauty media, mediate insight. That is, because it's a beautiful book, it's a work of art. It has aesthetics in it. How do you make the aesthetics of the book facilitate understanding? The seminar form doesn't do that. The seminar form simply cannot do justice to that. You have to have some sort of participatory uh, form, even more than this one. So <clears throat> I'd like to illustrate this a little <clears throat> by uh, putting it in these terms. The medium is the message, the way we put it out in some ways determines the message and <clears throat> the medium of revelation, the ultimate medium of revelation is actually music. Let's try it out. I am now muting the music a little and I, to see if I can do that right, I am muting the music. So the voices here are praising God. How would this work if 
breaking into these voices of praise. We suddenly hear the voice of accusation. How would that work? How will the praises sound against the horizon of an accusing voice? I need to stop that one here and move on. <clears throat> but I hope my illustration was not totally wasted. There is a voice of proclamation and acclamation in that song. But in Revelation, the horizon, the sounding chamber of those voices happen against the voice of accusation. So there is a trifonal character to Revelation. It is not easy to convey. So, by way of review, three elements in the how-to of reading Revelation are simple. Become a re-reader, pay attention to the Old Testament echoes, be aware that God is not the only one who is at work in the world. Re-reading is a, the hallmark of a major reader, as Nabokov puts it. And in Revelation's case, it is a necessity because we need a sense of the whole to understand the parts. And as you become a rereader of Revelation, rereader of Revelation, yes, but also in view of Revelation's use of the Old Testament, you become a rereader of the whole Bible. It is quite, <coughs> uh, quite uh, inescapable to say that that God is not the only one who is at work in the world, cannot be said too strongly. Many a reader mistakenly assign to God actions that in Revelation are the work of the evil one, and everything goes wrong if you do that. And the dialogical character of Revelation's message invites an interactive mode of appropriation. It is a message begging to be performed. And I have contacted some major uh, churches in my faith community. I have asked them, when are you going to perform Revelation congregationally and assign different voices and it will facilitate appropriation if we did that. <clears throat> Revelation's world of symbols, images, allusions, poetry and music is ill-suited to the seminar format. They sing a new song, says John in Revelation 14.3. And yes, <clears throat> to sing the new song is the ultimate mode of expression in this book. To learn to sing the new song, certainly, amen, as Revelation puts it. <clears throat>